made uh, government leadership live. Um, we have an exciting show today with uh, three guests that I'm, I'm very happy to introduce. Um, it, some of you who may have followed the show know that in the past we've mostly done case studies. Those case studies are available at the Agile Government Leadership uh, YouTube channel where you can see the previous uh, six shows that we've been having about once a month. This show we're trying to change the format to make it a little more interesting. Uh, although our guests certainly are capable of presenting uh, case studies of their own, we are instead talking about a specific topic, which is the use of free and open source software to make government more agile. Um, so uh, we have here members of the steering committee, Son Tran and Bill Haight. Uh, Bill is the CIO of Salt Lake City, and Son works for the Federal Broadcasting Commission. I believe, Son, perhaps you can correct me. Uh, Broadcasting Board of Governors. Ah, uh, thank you. Um, our guests today, uh, in alphabetical order, are um, Eric Mill, Henry Poole, and Dave Zinich, Zinich uh, whose name I always have mispronounced. Um, Eric is sort of a hacker extraordinaire and a technologist at 18F. Uh, Henry is the CEO of Civic Actions and a member of the board of the Free Software Foundation, although he's not officially speaking for them today. Um, and Dave Zinich uh, is with 18F Consulting and previously was a general counsel of the city of Washington, D.C. Uh, so he is an attorney who codes, which is uh, unusual but not in, not incredibly rare because there are several of them working for 18F, uh, including Aaron Snow. Um, so David, uh, my first question is for you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about 18F Consulting and how it uses free and open source software uh, and, and what its commitment to free and open source software is in particular? Sure. <clears throat> so thanks for, for having me. Um, like, uh, uh, like Rob said, I'm with 18F Consulting, um, and 18F Consulting um, is uh, part of 18F. Uh, 18F is uh, part of the GSA, um, and the mission of uh, 18F and 18F Consulting is to transform the way that the federal government builds and buys digital services. Um, and in particular, 18F Consulting focuses on the buys uh, digital services. And so what do I mean by that um, is we're working a lot with agencies who are in the process of building um, a system um, or uh, buying a system, and we help them, we advise them about what they should be doing, what the system should look like, what are the, uh, the tools that they should be uh, implementing, who are the types of people that they should have on their team, um, and uh, what are the vendors that they should be trying to attract to work on the project. Um, and oftentimes what this looks like um, is uh, through workshops, um, through um, you know, actual writing uh, documentation related to solicitations and uh, government procurement, um, and oftentimes we're just advising them about their stack. Um, and uh, with respect to uh, free and open source, um, we are uh, at, at 18F, we're a, uh, an open source shop. Um, we always default to open source. Um, and one of the reasons that we advocate that agencies uh, default to open source is because it can help avoid vendor lock-in issues. Um, it can also create uh, additional opportunities for the public to participate with the government in building applications that the government needs and also that the public would, would need. Um, and other parts of the government can use uh, the tools that uh, we've built, um, and we can use uh, part, uh, tools from other parts of the government that they've built. Um, and so we've discovered uh, that open source uh, has been a real force multiplier, for lack of a better word, um, across government and making sure that we have great digital services. Thank you very much. Um, so my next question is for uh, Eric. Um, so Eric, you and I have written an essay about the use of open source in government. Uh, when I worked at 18F, we wrote that together. Um, and since then, things have probably evolved a little bit. Um, can you uh, tell us how 18F uses free and open source software um, and specifically what benefits um, you guys obtain from that use? Sure. So, um, you know, I think uh, David said a lot of great things about uh, how, why we're open source and, and why we do that. Um, we have, I think, the strongest open source policy in the United States uh, as far as government goes. Um, 
Well, I would love to be wrong, but we uh, we simply open source everything. So it is beyond our default. It is it is our default for everything. But we also, if you want to write software here at 18F and you want to keep it closed, you have to justify it quite strongly on a number of narrow rules. And uh, you know, it, and even if you do that, we will still at least document the things that we are not working on in the open so, and why, um, which we've only had to do once. Um, so that is uh, that's a very strong policy that it, that has a number of different ramifications. So I mean, one, we have a lot of repositories of code that we publish, um, but it also really changes the way that it feels to work here. I think compared to a lot of government folks government places and a lot of other places I've worked, even in the private sector, where, you know, uh, open source, well, so there's two, there's a dichotomous thing. Um, it makes open source uh, a, an exciting thing in our business development and interactions with clients for, for, for which it is very new and for which, you know, they're maybe not used to doing this and like it in theory until it's time to actually do it and then they are a little concerned. Uh, we have something really strong to point to. Um, but the other side of that is that institutionally here on the development team, on the engineering team, uh, it's quite boring. You know, we are just working in the open all the time until it's, you know, not a performance art, but more just like breathing. You know, it actually relaxes us in our work, um, and it's not like we're making public proclamations with every commit or every issue discussion, and, you know, that I think fosters a really healthy environment for the team. Thank you very much. Um, so from my little dashboard, I can see that we have four viewers, which is a little bit low for our show. I hope we didn't fail to promote this because we have such excellent guests today, which I, uh, I would like to thank them for coming. Uh, if you are a viewer, uh, I invite you to send in a question. You should have a chat window uh, somewhere on your screen where you can type in a question, which I'll see as the moderator to direct to our guests. And it's more important to us to answer the audience's question than to answer the questions uh, that I've prepared ahead of time for our guests. So if you have a question, um, and I can well imagine there are going to be some contentious issues here, please chat it in. Um, I would like to um, mention that uh, I really like what Eric just said. In fact, uh, Eric and I called that the red thread policy in the sense that if it's okay to have secrets within your code but they should be as thin and clearly demarcated as possible. And so the metaphor we use, which I, I ripped off from Stephen King, is that it should be like a red thread in a white handkerchief. You should, you should have a very thin set of secrets that you can change very quickly. Um, so now I would uh, like to direct a question at Henry. Um, Henry, you're coming from the other side in the sense that uh, you work for a firm which uh, serves government and other organizations, um, uh, and your firm is fiercely devoted to open source, and I believe it's the case that everything you produce is always open source, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, can you please um, comment on how you see free and open source software fitting into government actions? Um. Well, yeah, I can probably do that. <laughs> um, you know, to, what what Eric what Eric said about the of the the happiness or the joy, the fun of work. You know that the, that this policy that um, 18F has, we find the same policy in our own in our own firm. Uh, we find the really own the feelings of it's just it's more fun. Um, to work where uh, where you you don't have you don't have all of these uh, artificial silos and barriers and constraints and you know it, it, it it's like if if you lived in a oppressive government or a dictatorship and then you just decided to move you know and create your own um, free society like the United States created where where it was really created to secure blessings of liberty um, in a large part that th that's what happens when you have a, a dedication to free software or Libre software for you know inside an organization it, you know and, and it it's a it is just you know the, the freedom is fun um, and in particular you know why why I think this is so important for government is um, is it's 
it, it makes government more fun for coders. <laughs> um, is one reason. Um, you can actually create better code as well because you you're you're sharing, um, it, you know, you're sharing and you're learning as much as you as you know you're just sharing and learning constantly. Um, you can your free software in particular it protects the rights to use, study, copy, modify, and distribute software. It it makes it possible. Um, and this you know those things give government uh, more power, um, more control. You know, it, you know, as I think it, um, I, I think it was, it was it Dave said something about lock-in, um, that it it eliminates the, it makes it very difficult to 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 lock somebody into purchasing your things. It it stops that uh, that kind of control. Um, anyway, those are the reasons I think it. Well, and but to the reasons you know, why why do we you know why should we you know uh, use free software? Um, I I think it's. You know, I think it's a. Uh, you know, why should we live in the United States? It's just a great place. So, so I, is good. So, thank you, Henry. I'd like to riff on that a little bit by asking Dave to weigh in on that. Um, I I know I'm a little weird in the sense that I, I I want anything I do to be as usable by as many people in the whole world as possible. But um, you mentioned, Dave, that one agency could share things and I think you were talking about with within the agency which of course in the federal government is huge so that's a very reasonable um, thing but I I also would suggest the principle you know that if the FBI is developing something it never makes sense for the same code not to be available to the Navy or the Department of Agriculture if the FBI is going to pay for the thing to be developed the, the fact that the Department of Agriculture may or may not have use for whatever is developed for the FBI is uh, something that should be left for the Department of Agriculture to decide. Uh, so, Dave, maybe you could um, uh, share your comments on that. Sure. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. And I, um, I actually did mean that you could share not just within an agency but across agencies. Um, although, let me actually go, go one step further just to say that you oftentimes see within the same agency you have two different offices buying the same thing um, and it's it's a really uh, it's a common pattern um, that applies in government where one office doesn't know what an off another office is doing or one agency certainly doesn't know what another agency is doing um, and having a, uh, a place like github or bitbucket or even just <laughs> Google um, allows people to discover other people's open source projects and say hey They've built something that I can adapt for my own uses, um, and I saw this play out a lot when I was uh, before coming to um, to the to ATF. When I was general counsel to the DC Council, we started building things um, that other cities and other states uh, could use in uh, in their uh, for for their purposes. Um, and what we discovered is that the same problems and the same patterns emerge across uh, agencies and across governments. Um, and by having a preference, uh, and in ATNF's case, a not just as Eric says, a default, but a, a mandatory policy of free and open source, um, it creates the opportunity for network effects that otherwise wouldn't be available. Um, and it's a um, it's a potential game changer. And you know, for what it's worth, one thing that I I like to app, uh, to sort of reference um, is that one of the most popular databases of all time, uh, SQLite, um, was built for the Navy. Um, and by having that be committed to the public domain, um, it now powers basically everything from browsers to iPhones to websites across the world. Um, and it's uh, you know a simple thing that was built once, but had you know millions and potentially billions of uh, downstream uses. So, thank you very much. And we we have our first question from the audience, which I'll get to in just a minute. But I wonder if um, if Bill Haight, who's the CIO of Salt Lake City, has a comment on that. Um, you know, if, if you think just at the surface level, many pieces of software developed for the federal government, of course, are not useful to the average citizen, and they're not even useful to a city or a government, if you imagine that you have to use the whole system. However, it is the nature of free and open source software that it is highly, highly componentized, and that part of the community uh, is around is focused around learning how to use the individual um, components of that system. 
Um, Eric and I identified a lot of those sort of commodity components, bootstrap is being an example of, of a very important um, uh, commodity system is valuable for anything. But I do believe it's the case that today uh, the cities and states are not cooperating with the federal government except to the extent that if the federal government contributes something to an open source project without even knowing it, uh, a city or state which is using that project will become aware of that. Uh, Bill, do you, can you comment on that? <clears throat> sure. Um, I think you're absolutely right. I think uh, that typically most municipal governments, uh, which of course is where I spend my time, <clears throat> we tend to operate in our own little silo, in our own little world, and we tend to focus on our immediate needs, not necessarily looking to um, other sources for solutions along those lines. Um, Salt Lake City does contribute to, um, to open source on a couple of different areas, pr primarily around our permitting uh, systems and, and so forth, but larger than looking for specific components or pieces or sector sections of code, we tend to look more for um, overall solutions and, and the attitude, at least um, in the local governments that I work with or that I'm aware of, the attitude is more of one of uh, let's see what we can buy as opposed to what are we going to build. Um, that, that is turning a little bit right now, I think, but uh, typically we're, we're more interested in, in procurement of software and services rather than trying to build that. So it's it's an interesting phenomenon to me around open source, and we do use uh, quite a bit of open source in our uh, applications, particularly around web servers and that sort of thing, but even there, we're not looking to contribute to the source or modifying the source so much as we are looking for a lower cost alternative to one of the you know, larger corporate vendors of systems or software. Hey, hey Rob, it, it, it may be, uh, I may be sort of going out of line, but there, well, there's actually one thing that uh, sort of plays into this with respect to something that Eric Mill worked on um, since we're talking about it. Um, the, it might be an opportunity to talk about the analytics uh, plat, uh, the analytics app um, that uh, Eric built and what happened next. Yeah, why don't, why don't we talk about that, and then um, I, I actually would like to tie Bill's comments to this question we've received from Ben Morris about the buy versus build decision, so I'd like to come back to that, but why don't we talk about um, anal analytics right now? Um, sure, so I, I'm happy to talk about that. It's a, I won't you know drag it on too much, but there, it was a very nice example of, uh, so we built a, uh, essentially a public-facing uh, dashboard, it's uh, analytics.usa.gov, that uh, reflects collected, centrally collected statistics from a number of distributed.gov websites in the federal government uh, based on a program that's been in operation for a couple of years. And we, we built that, um, so we built it as an open source project and we specifically componentized it so that the front end is a static site that is one app and that the, the actual data collection uh, part that talks with uh, the analytics API and converts it into files that can be pulled in is its own command line module that can be used for other things. So what was nice about that is that we saw uh, the city of Philadelphia actually run, take that and run with it, and they set up, they, they forked the styles and set up a public-facing dashboard using both the front and back end code, and they're, they're you know, while they're going their own way on the front end, like with theming and everything, they're, uh, you know, we've actually given them permissions, they're a contributor now on our, on our data collection component. So that was not, not only a nice collaboration story, but also a satisfying success story about modularization. Um, we've had other people use the command line tool for other non-dashboard things as well, which has been nice to see. Thank you, Eric. Um, so, so that raises a number of complicated questions, and I'd, I'd like to address them sort of by addressing what Bill said in this, this question for Ben Morris. But first, let me ask you, um, in the code you did for the analytics stuff, how many lines of code did you actually write? Uh, so, you know, the, the actual analytics uh, collection project, um, it, the, the data work to take that 
they have an API and make a new API from it that made sense for the project. You know, that was uh, not a lot of lines of code at all. We're probably talking, uh, you know, the, the part that's activated for our work is a couple of hundred, maybe something like that. Right. And that is, you know, we're, it's a node module, and we pull in a ream of node modules in order to support that. And that's many, many thousands of lines of code that we're benefiting from the community having uh, produced in order to do that. So we only have to add the business logic that's necessary for us. Right. And so that's ex that's uh, exactly what I wanted to hear. Um, you know, I do come at these things from the point of view of what can I as a coder contribute from uh, Bill Haight's point of view as a CIO, you know, his job is to provide things to the to the citizen or to the city, not necessarily to give back to the community. But I think what Eric just pointed out is that often the work that is being done in the open source community is not the construction of new software per se, but the bolting together of components which have made been made very easy to use by the fact that they are freely and openly licensed and also by the community that has grown up around that. Um, so now I'd like to read Ben's question and try to answer it directly. Um, many federal government uh, OSS skeptics cite, quote, who's going to support it if something goes wrong, end quote, as a reason to stick with Microsoft, Oracle, et cetera, stack that, that is a, a closed source stack or partially closed source stack, which I think is a thin argument. How do you, panel, refute this in discussions with agencies? Um, and I would love to answer that question, but I am not a panelist. I'm the moderator. So uh, Dave, maybe you could take a crack at this, and, and Henry might want to weigh in on this as well. Um, so let me, uh, let me paraphrase Ben's question by saying, what do you say to a government person who believes you should be buying software in order to have better maintenance than free and open source software provides? Thank you. I guess I would respond in two ways. Um, and the first is sort of the, uh, the optimistic way and then just sort of the pessimistic way, right? So the optimistic way is that you should always be looking to what is uh, the right solution for your particular problem. Um, so there are going to be some situations where it makes sense to buy commercial off the shelf um, and some from a vendor. Um, and perhaps when you do that, um, you know, you want to sort of look to see whether or not there's a, you know, the business cases aligns with the, with the private sector, right? So um, as much as some of us don't like Microsoft Word, the reality is that Microsoft Word is the sort of thing that you don't want to customize and build yourself, right? You want to use something that the rest of the world uses. Um, so, you know, you want to make sure that you're using the things that are maintained by reputable vendors, and that's fine. Um, but I guess the other thing that I would say is the flip side to that is that there's plenty of stuff that's, uh, you know, sold by a, a commercial vendor uh, that's not maintained. And I would, like, point to Windows NT. Um, and, you know, it seemed like a great thing, and it was really useful for a, lot of, for a long time, but at some point they stopped supporting it as well. Um, and so the reality is that we have to be constantly adapting our systems and constantly making sure that we have the right the right system for the time within government and within the you know just within any technology shop. Um, and I don't think open source sort of answers the question about whether something is mature enough to be used in production. Um, and that's really the responsibility of, uh, of of us to make sure that the tool that we're using in a particular uh, case meets our need. Thank you. And, and this gives me a chance to ask Henry a question, because I know this is something that um, at least Richard Stallman has publicly addressed a, a lot of times. Um, you know, if you're using free and open source software, you can normally pay someone for it. The, the fact that it's free doesn't mean that it's gratis, and it doesn't necessarily mean that the, the maintenance of it is done um, for free as well. If you choose to, for many things, you can buy a support contract, uh, whether the software is free or open or not. Um, so maybe, I'm, I'm sorry, Henry, I may have answered the question, but could, could you comment on that uh, from your point of view? Well, if the question is, do you, do you need to buy software in, in order to have better maintenance? It, it, um, no, you don't need to buy software and have better maintenance. You just, in, in, <laughs> if you you can buy software and you can buy maintenance, um, you can bundle it in like you you buy insurance. Um, um, you know, 
there are thousands of employees, tens of thousands of employees at IBM that support free software, and every other, you know, large uh, vendor, or, you know, systems integrator. Um, there, you know, that you. So that's. I mean, it's. I, I understand that that's a question that a lot of people have, and you know, maybe a long time ago when there wasn't you know, when when the adoption wasn't so high for free software or when it wasn't so obvious that the free software was actually underneath the proprietary software. Um, you know, but basically it's a, it's a matter of packaging up and delivering service, you know, delivering product or services. And there are, you know, lawyers, um, lots of lawyers around, but that doesn't mean they make proprietary use of the laws, you know, of the things that they write. Um, there's a, the, there are, there are, um, there are a lot of ways to um, make money and monetize and get support. Um, there are a lot of so I, I I think that for me the the any of these things it's it's very hard to come up with a general answer. It really, you have to talk to the individual and find out really what their needs are. And you know so. Rob, this this is Dave again. If if I could just like chime in with one sort of add on to it, the thing that I wish I had said, right? To answer this question, you just have to decide whether Encyclopedia Britannica is better than Wikipedia, right? I mean, one is a proprietary solution that existed and was a really really big, you know, one monolithic provider um, versus Wikipedia, which is distributed open source. <clears throat> play and obviously everyone uses Wikipedia and not Britannica. It would have been crazy in 1985 to say that you know the internet is going to swallow up Encyclopedia Britannica but here we are in 2015 and that's that's the reality. Yeah, so, and I'll add I'll, I'll, I like to I'll add one thing too. Imagine if all of the food that we ate in the world had been done in a laboratory had been built in a lab and you could choose to go with you know, genetically created food in a lab, or you could choose to, food, you know, get the food that just grew on the planet naturally. You know, which one's better? And if you really started with proprietary food, you might be really complaining about a lot of the things that grow naturally. Um, you know, if you look at medicines, it's the same. You know, we packaged up medicine. Most medicine is actually, it's organic. It's um, we're packaging, we're packaging it up and creating something out of something that's very naturally happening in an open, in an open system. Software um, can grow and does get developed by people that are passionate and open about it. And the more open and responsive, the more, the more social people are with their code, the better the code lives in an ecosystem where it's all connected. Thank you. Um, that reminds me of a joke, which will show how old I am. Um, when I was in college studying computer science back in um, 1984, uh, there was a program called Fortune, which would print little pithy sayings at the bottom of your Unix thing. And one of the fortunes uh, told a joke, and that was, what's the difference between a software house and a university? And the answer was, it's just the same, except that with the university, the software is free, and it works, and you can get your questions answered. Um, and the, the point of that is not necessarily to pick on private firms, but to point out that um, Americans invented computer programming for the most part. And it started out more or less as a shared open source university um, behavior. And then somehow with the rise of Microsoft, we started thinking of it as proprietary software construction being sort of the normal way you do things. Um, but I'd just like to remind everybody that AT&T, for whatever reason, chose not to make billions and billions of dollars and gave Unix away for free um, back in the, the late 70s. And so it was really only in the 80s that we started thinking of proprietary software as normal. Uh, that's my own little personal take on that. Um, now I'd like to return to the audience who have asked a couple of questions. I see another one from Ben, but I would like to uh, answer this question from Frank McNally. Do you think open source principles can apply to non-coding efforts like writing policies, acquisition documents, and other public work products? Boy, that's a load of questions. If so, in what ways? Yes. Uh, absolutely yes. yes. Um, so, you know, I, I wrote an article once upon the time um, of that the first, uh, the first legal hackers uh, were the framers of the United States Constitution. Um, so here was a document um, that was like quintessentially open source. Um, it defined America um, and defined, you know, what we were going to be as a country. 
Um, and it could have been just a document that was kept by sort of the oligarchs uh, and kept by, you know, the people in charge. Um, but instead it was shared and publicized and, you know, voted on and ratified by uh, the people of the United States of America and now is the governing document for uh, the free world and has been forced to modify you know, many, 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 many ways uh, since then. Um, so fundamentally open source uh, precedes, <laughs> precedes software um, and yes, it absolutely can be used in other contexts. Thank you. I, I'd like Eric to weigh in on that um, perhaps a little more practically and less theoretically. Um, so um, Eric, could you please address how you apply open source principles to things like manuals and style guides and, and procurement procedures and other sorts of things? Sure. Um, well, the, the most recent relevant example, um, it's not exactly one of those things, but we, we did policy development as an open source project. Um, uh, that's something that uh, you know, 18F sort of informally collaborated with uh, the White House on creating a HTTPS everywhere policy. And the, the policy document itself, we uh, released for public comment in March. And we released that you know, on a decent looking microsite, but with an, an attached GitHub repository. And we rendered everything in Jekyll. Um, and we, we, op we directed public comment to occur on GitHub. And we had a number of, I mean, you know, certainly just some people opening issues, uh, being like thumbs up or you know, do this thing. And we received some pull requests as well. Um, and we were able to you know, incorporate those, uh, those, some of those pull requests directly into our policy as we finalized the process. And we also just generated a far more engaged population uh, in our work. So it, we didn't end up you know, having to sacrifice or, co or compromise on anything as a result. Instead, we simply had more people caring about it, more people hearing about it, and more people being proud about it. And we... And I was really happy that, you know, for, for a high-profile policy, that people became comfortable using public comment and using open source collaborative software to do that. I'd like to add a couple. I've got a couple of examples, too, Rob. Go ahead, Henry. Yeah, so the one is the Free Software Foundation. The, the GPL, the, the version of the GPL, which was very, very, you know, which was created years and years ago, needed, it needed to be upgraded. Um, there were very large companies around the world that were that were relying upon the GPL for their businesses. Um, the communities of people that were using it changed drastically over the decade or 15 or 20 years since it was created. Um, and the process that the FSF went through was, was to set up um, a system called STAT, which was actually the place where we, where we first used the Afero uh, license. It was the first uh, time that um, that was used the FSF, um, and that that process was done fully open with a lot of different groups around the world contributing and all done online transparently. Um, it, you know, a legal document, you know, in legal, um, it, that that's an example. Um, they're also, from a, from a business, the process and creative, um, when we started our firm 10 years ago, or 11 years ago, we just decided we were going to default to everything. Every single thing was going to be open, except for you know perhaps a, you know certain private information for employees. Um, so all of our design work from day one was shared, and we went and it, that was difficult because a lot of the a lot of the organizations, the nonprofits, or our customers, you know, had some concerns over that. But we basically said, look, everything is open. It's all open. You can use it. We'll create it. You'll have your own unique s solution. Um, but we can all reuse it. And it, it was really effective because we could reuse things across organizations. They could reuse stuff. We could train new designers to use it. Um, it wasn't any problem at all from a business point of view. In fact, it created more dedicated and happy customers. Um, it also, you know, it, it let us uh, have relationships with other firms that were interested in the same thing. We also did it with our all of our internal documents, so proposals. So anybody could go and leave and fork the company if they wanted to. They could take everything, <laughs> which it didn't, you know, it happened. There was a, a company that started a theming uh, firm ar around, you know, that left us. And, you know, it was all good. Um, it didn't hurt us. In fact, it was, you know, it helped us. Um, and we also, one of the things we gave away was our pricing or estimating spreadsheets. So we had created a way to model and price and estimate large-scale, you know, stacks, open source, free software, you know, uh, services, CRM and CMS. And we had hundreds of companies 
startup companies taking that and using it as a basis to get better at delivering their services. And over the years, a number of people would come to us and say, hey, I want to go to work for you, and I found out about your company through this contribution that you did. So it didn't, you know, I think with, with software itself, it's pretty clear that there, that there are a lot of benefits. Um, I think it's a little scarier with process. With content, it's fairly clear that it can be really uh, well done at large scale if you look at Wikipedia. So I, I think it works quite well across the board. Well, thank you. That's that's fascinating. Um, we do have a question for Ben, but I, I'm afraid right now it's a kind of a technical question. It would suck a little bit of the, the energy out of this. So I'd like to ask Dave and Eric to comment on this aspect of what Henry just said. So, so Henry basically just made an argument that you can have a functional business where you're being very open, not only with your code, but with your, your processes. I would argue that freedom of speech and the idea of equal protection under the law argue that government has a responsibility to do precisely the same thing. And that in, if a firm has the option to do that, and may be able to successfully do it. However, it is, in fact, the responsibility of the government in order to allow public comment and free speech for the software development process, in addition to the code, to be open to public comment. Um, that does not necessarily mean that people can openly inject code into your code stream. You have to be very, very careful uh, about that. I wonder if Eric or Dave would like to comment on that. Uh, well, I can I can open by uh, reminding the audience, if they're not aware, that the, the Freedom of Information Act in the United States, and same at a lot of state and local governments, uh, means that all of, all of those meta processes and documents um, are often, usually, almost always, uh, designed to be publicly reviewable. Um, the way you know, Freedom of Information Act here in the U.S. was designed in the 1970s before the modern era of computing. But one of the one of the ways in which you know we think about openness and our, our open processes is you know if you why why make anybody even have to submit a request for this in the first place? Less work for them, less work for us. Uh, we, so just one less thing we have to think about day to day, and for our lawyers to think about. Um, I you know I. I Rob, I, I hate to be a little bit uh, less um, aggressive. I think that the government does have sort of a, a normative responsibility, um, but I don't think that the First Amendment um, or uh, equal protection or due process compel it. Um, but that that's not that's not to say they're not important things. Um, the you know the First Amendment, the right to petition government, probably gives people the right to publicly. Know, tell Congress that we're doing bad code or doing good code, um, and it probably gives them the right to tell us that we're doing bad code or good code. But I don't think there's a, uh, a constitutional or legal imperative to 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 make it available. That said, um, I think the government does have a responsibility to uh, to taxpayers and to citizens and non-citizens that we're being responsible stewards uh, for for them. Um, and in 99.9% .9 of the cases that uh, that Eric and I are working on, that means uh, that's open, free and open source code. And the way that free and open source code gets done best is when people have the opportunity to, to comment and weigh in and uh, offer ways to improve it. Okay, well, thank you. Perhaps um, that's a debate for another day. Uh, we Let me now shift gears a little bit and uh, submit this question from Ben Morris, which is... Um, uh, not so legalistic a question, but it's more about technology. Ben writes, there seems to be a general perception that for custom web application development, .NET or Java are enterprise grade, in quotes, and Ruby, Python, Node are not. Uh, I wonder if, uh, if um, my guest, uh, including Henry, would like to comment on that. Uh so I mean, I, I'll guess I'll jump in first. Um, you, the things that you described as not enterprise grade are the things that we use in our work every day, for the most part. Um, I think all or nearly all of our work is is in those things, and and I think a lot of people who come from the web development community, especially, uh, have you know, have developed large scale applications using those technologies. 
Um, I'm not sure what technologies Google Plus is built on. Uh, much of Google is built on Python. Uh, when you know, in the tweets that we sent about this, it was scaled up using uh, Ruby and still uses uh, Ruby in a number of places. Um, you know, these are it's it's a the human factors tend to be a lot more important than your your tribalistic choice of language in these matters. Um, the other thing I would say is that oftentimes, um, you know, defining what constitutes enterprise grade or non-enterprise grade sort of misses the point. You don't want to have a power, you know, you don't want to have a power soft you're cutting paper, um, and you certainly don't want to try to cut, uh, you know, cut paper, or, you know, cut some like wood with scissors, right? You want to have the right tool that's appropriate for the application. Um, and one of the things that we discover in government is that we've been using power saws to cut paper. Um, and so what we're trying to do is uh, align the tools that make sense for what the actual applications that we need are. Um, the good news is that, um, you know, for, um, you know, whether you're talking about .NET, which is now uh, the doc, not, that that core is now open source, um, or uh, languages like Ruby, Node, Python, Go, and, and others, um, they're pretty powerful um, for <laughs> the vast majority of applications that exist. Okay, thank you. Um, so I would remind our audience that we welcome your questions, and um, it is perhaps a little bit of a problem here that um, uh, this is a little bit of a free and open source software love fest. Uh, if somebody wants to uh, argue that free and open source software is not going to make the government more agile, we would be happy to hear from you. Uh, but I have an interesting question from Neil Smith here, which I would like to address to the panel. Uh, Neil writes, clearly the panel has figured out all the rationale for why open source can be a powerful good. I don't know if there's sarcasm in that or not. With power comes responsibility, the lesson of Spider-Man. What are the responsible imperatives to go along with the power? Um, and I assume, and maybe Neil, you can correct me if I've got that wrong. Um, this is a question about what are the responsibilities for the government when it chooses to, first of all, use, and perhaps secondly, contribute to uh, free and open source software. And Neil, if I've got that wrong, please chat in a correction. Thank you. So I'll, I'll take a take a take a go at it. Um, so the decision whether to use open source um, has already been made, right? So uh, at least with 18 and a half, we've already just, we've decided that we're going to use open source. And so um, the that uh, in terms of whether the sort of the free choice elements of power and responsibility, like that that bridge has been crossed for there. Um, and then once once we are we've decided to use open source. Now the question is how do we uh, how do we select responsibly and more importantly how do we make sure that we're actually being part of the community? So one of the things that I, I don't know if it was Eric who first used this phrase with me, um, but he said we don't want to be you know um, by the web we want to be of the web um, and we want to really be part part of the community um, that we're drawing from and so that means we're going to be sending upstream commits to. Um, to repositories that we draw from. It means that we're going to be contributing code that others can draw from. Um, and I think that that responsibility exists for governments just as much as it exists for people who are you know, hacking on the side or for, the, for their private gain. Um, it's, we have to be part of the larger community of open source. So um, let me challenge that a little bit. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, Eric. So let, let's suppose that you are a... Um, you're responsible, you're a program manager in the federal government, and you're um, responsible for a $20 million project, and it's very important that that code and that system be delivered securely to the public on a certain day, and everyone who works for you is worried about hitting that deadline. And you view contribution back to the community as a tax on the time of your workers, and therefore a tax on the uh, on the money of the American people, because in some sense their time is is costing the American taxpayer money. Uh, what would you say to that argument? That, so I guess that you should not go out of your way to contribute back because it's expensive. So this, this sometimes like the, the, that question is a, first of all it's a great question, um, and it reminds me often of sort of a mis 
um, a misallocation of uh, risk, right? So obviously, if you're trying to hit deadline and you're trying to get something done, your priority should be getting stuff done, right? That's that's always the priority. But you shouldn't be in a position where you cannot also um, make as part of your plan a responsible way of being part of the community. Um, you know, if you're constantly in that mode of you know shipping on deadline and never having the ability to be you know to take a step back and reflecting on uh, you know the code that you're shipping and how you're shipping it and where where it's coming from, um, you're actually going to end up being worse. Um, you're going to get uh, you're going to get developers and engineers who aren't as satisfied in the job. Um, you're not going to have as much familiarity with the source code that you're actually using on a day-to-day -day basis, um, and you're going to burn out. Um, it's it's just not a sustainable path, and so. Um, it seems like a, an important thing in the moment, but you have to take a step back and remember that you know this is all part of a larger, uh, larger discussion um, about how you're allocating resources. Yeah, I think it's important to note there that there are two kinds of upstream contributions that we could be talking about there, right? Like one is, uh, are you releasing the work that you're making publicly, right? And there should be no tax associated with that because anything that that any any perceived tax that that gives you like uh, you know, being more more careful about how you break out your code, making sure there aren't passwords or keys in your code, uh, licensing it properly. Those are all things you really should be doing for everything, even if it were closed. You would need to do these things and answer these questions. And if and if we're talking about um, you know taking uh, modifications to outside work and making sure that those go back upstream, then that's like that's the ability. It's not good to, to maintain your own fork uh, of uh, some outside project in the long run unless you have very, very good reasons because you're going to miss out on the benefits and security fixes and uh, that the upstream project does. So it is in your project's direct interest in order to, to do that kind of work. Um, so, and in general, I would just say, you know, if, if, you're, if you're budgeting yourself and your time so tightly that all you can do is look down at your keyboard and keep typing in code until it's done. You're you're not setting yourself up for success. You're not setting yourself up for for happiness, which is not setting yourself up for success. I could add something to that too, Rob. Please do. Yeah, you know the looking at looking at software like it's this thing that you're just going to take. And you're gonna make it change, and you're gonna do something with it. That's like it's like you're raping the forest of its fruit um, and destroying it in the process. And it's not the, the you know like you could do that, sure. And then you won't go back. I mean, it won't be there when you get back. It won't be the same. And so, if but if you look at it like it's a long term, and if you really look at the if you look at the software not like it's in this thing, intangible, if you look at it like a set of relationships, it's, it's really a community that's growing it, that's creating it in the moment. And, you know, learning how to be respectful and mindful of the language and the culture and the way it works, you know, creating a bridge or a relationship between your own community and the community that's creating this software, that's what, it's, that's what will reduce your costs long term. It will reduce your costs in implementation immediately, because if you need to have a little bit of help, um, you know, figuring out what's how something works, and you're in in relationship with the right with the maintainer of it, right? it's a lot easier than spending three or four weeks hitting your head against a wall trying to figure something out. If you can just you know reach out and ask somebody, but you know, if you don't spend the time to learn the language and the culture and how to how to relate, there is not there's not anything there other than just you know there's no relationship. So to me, it's a better choice, short term, long term. It's less expensive. It's not a tax. It may seem like it, and and if you're if you're on a deadline and you've got a bunch of engineers that don't yet know how to do this, and you've got to ship, then go ahead and ship, and then just ask for apology and figure out and do a retrospective, <laughs> and figure out what you did right or wrong and try to do better the next time. We can uh, try. Anyway, thank you, thank you. Um, so I have a note from a question from Frank McNally, but I'm afraid Frank, I may put you off because. I, I want to uh, resonate what Henry just said back to some other things that have been commented on here, which I think at least many government employees 
probably have not been exposed to. And it is a little bit of a problem because I wasn't exposed to it as much as I should have been before I was a Presidential Innovation Fellow and in, in entered government service because I was working for a closed source company that used very little open source and I was unaware of the various mechanisms by which the community helps you with open source software. And I think if people haven't had the experience of using GitHub and making pull requests and submitting issues and seeing how quickly normally those issues are responded to, um, and of course we all use Stack Exchange, which is, is an example of a community that um, answers questions very, very quickly. Um, I think it can be very hard to understand. And, and Eric and I once started an essay um, on the, the culture of hacking together, physically together, um, in, in the same room, uh, which unfortunately we did not publish. Um, I wonder if our guests, uh, Dave and Eric in particular, could comment on thinking that, that the average federal employee may not have had this experience of using GitHub and interacting with the open source community. Um, can you comment on some of the things that happen and some ways to leverage um, that? I, community is too simple a word, but that community and its set of behaviors. Sure. <clears throat> so I can speak from personal experience, um, which is that in 2012 I had no idea about any of this stuff. Um, and what really got me involved in this space um, was a hackathon um, and observing um, in real time um, developers and designers um, work together on GitHub um, and collaboratively to build uh, to build a site um, in a day. Um, and you know that blew my mind. Um, I was a government employee, had no knowledge of any of this space, um, and it, uh, it, it frankly it changed it changed my life uh, in a pretty profound way. Um, and I think that, you know, once you start getting into open source and you start understanding um, how this works, um, you start actually looking at the rest of the world and go, why isn't this open source? So, for example, I'll look at a news article and there'll be a typo and I want to submit a pull request. <laughs> it, it, they don't have it, but, you you know, you start to think that that's weird that they don't have uh, an opportunity for you to, to submit typo fixes. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I often... Uh, relate to colleagues who are not involved in uh, software development and open source um, is that the, uh, the open source community that emerged around software development didn't happen um, by accident. It happened very intentionally and by design, um, but it works not because, um, you know, not because people put a lot of effort into it, but it's actually just a better way of doing things in many cases. Um, being able to work collaboratively and have the tools that make collaboration possible um, ends up making you a better and uh, a more effective employee or a more effective and uh, happy person. Thank you. Um, uh, Eric, do you want to weigh in on that? Um, I, we probably don't have time in this show, but you know, you could devote a whole hour to the various ways in which um, someone can utilize the open source community? I mean, the open source community is behaving, be, being a part of, of the open source community and the open source movement has completely changed how I see the world and how I spend my time in it. Um, and it affects uh, the kind of work I do, uh, not just on software. Um, it affects how I look at collaboration and how I view risk and what things that I maybe I used to see as more risky than I do now. Um, you know, there's just a general sense that, like, that everything is going to turn out okay, that, uh, that love can win over fear, and, uh, you know, that uncertainty is, uh, is okay, that there's, we, can, we can make a better place together. Thank you. So this, this hour has gone by very quickly. Um, I, I would like to briefly ask this question that Frank McNally has submitted and then um, maybe allow our, our panelists to make closing remarks. Um, the question is, uh, Frank McNally says, curious, Cohen, where do you think government is on the open source adoption curve?
if Dave and Eric don't want to answer that, I'll I, answer it. So I think I think you know, um, open source is you know um, depends on where you're at in the stack, um, but I would I would venture a guess to say that now there's not a single site in existence that hasn't built off of open source software. Um, and you know whether that's at the server with Apache or whether that's uh, jQuery at the front end or whether it's viewed in a browser like uh, Firefox or Chrome, um, there's some element of open source software that's been built um, into the way that you're interacting with the web. So in terms of like where it's at in the mature maturation, co uh, maturation curve, um, that's the wrong question um, because open source is everywhere. It's just whether you're using it in the right way. Thank you. Yes, and um, I would like to point out it's almost like we need two words or we need to be very precise about what we're doing here. There's the use of open source, which in the sense that Apache and Linux are open source is very, very, very widely used. But there's then the contribution to open source and the use of open source at every level in your stack. And uh, I kind of wish we had two verbs for those different ways of looking at them. 18F contributes to open source and uses open source. Many companies or government agencies and companies use open source and also use some proprietary closed source software. Uh, and so we, we sort of need a more precise language to discuss that. Um, but uh, I would like... We're victims of our own success, Rob. <laughs> uh, so we only have four minutes left, so I would like to um, let our guests make closing remarks. Um, I noticed that we have one viewer uh, who has hung in there. Uh, Tamara, if you can hear me, if you would like to uh, make a closing remark or ask a closing question before we finish, that would be great. Um, if not, uh, uh, Eric, why don't we start with you? Um, well, I guess the uh, the main reaction I have is that it's I, I feel really uh, like we're we've passed critical mass in a lot of ways, and it's it's really refreshing to be part of you know a panel like this where um, you know I'm not the isolated radical uh, either on the panel or in my particular institution of residence at the moment, and I think that's you know I've I've had a couple of, I've had several people ask you know how we got away with having a, a really strong open source policy and the answer is that there are 80 of us and we all want it that way um, and that's uh, the, it describes a lot of what I hope is the change that that 18F can bring and it certainly has been the case when it comes to open source. Thank you. Uh, Henry? Um, yeah, <clears throat> well the I just mentioned this at the beginning. The the our our this great country we live in, which were, you know, was created in part to secure uh, blessings of liberty. And Libra software was created for exactly the same reason. You know, and free software in it protects it protects the rights for not just developers, but users, at least a lot of it does to use, study, copy, modify, and distribute software. Our government, our government, we may have a massive investment in technology. Um, we, we have a, I, in my opinion, we have a responsibility to make sure that the government has the ability to use, study, copy, modify, and distribute software. We can't secure ourselves if it's proprietary. And we have a tremendous amount of personal identifiable information we have a tremendous amount of responsibility and in my opinion the only way to do our job in protecting and making sure that we're doing the job for the citizens of our country is that if we have free if we have free software thank you very much Dave would you like yeah. to finish up how do you follow that um, I, I I guess I'd echo it um, both of uh, uh, you know, both the, the fact that we're at ATF trying to make some of those changes and also that this was something that existed before ATF is, is a really important um, component of the conversation. Um, you know, free and open source software enabled the Internet 
Um, it powers the internet. It enables uh, the demo- uh, you know, sort of the democratization that we see with the internet. Um, and you know, the the great question, um, and this was sort of you know when Ben Franklin uh, was coming out of the framing of the Constitution, you know, said, uh, "What are you What are you trying to do?" Or I can't remember the exact phrase. We're, we're making a republic if we can keep it. Um, and I think the responsibility is uh, is a shared responsibility to make sure that the internet that we want to see in the world continues to exist. Um, and I think it's going to largely depend on our ability to consume, uh, remix, use, and contribute back to open source, free and open source. Well, thank you very much. Um, so I hope it is the case that uh, the audio has been okay for everybody. It was a little weak for me. Um, this show will immediately go into the Agile Government Leadership Live um, YouTube channel if, you, if anyone would like to review it. I'd like to thank our guests, especially those guests who submitted questions. Um, and I would really like to thank our panelists. Um, uh, I thought this was a great discussion. Um, I, I wish we maybe were doing a little bit better job promoting this discussion to a wider audience, but at least now the video will be on YouTube. Thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your busy day. Um, And that's all for this show. Thanks.